Well, I'm excited to have a great uh, subject to cover today, and we're going to have several uh, podcasts on this subject, and it's dealing uh, with the new apostolic reformation or and uh, some of the accusations that's been uh, given. And over the course of time, we're going to try to deal with all of the different major issues. Um, and we'll have different people coming on today. We're going to have a couple of great scholars and men who have influenced me uh, very much. I just want to say for... Um, get the full introduction in a moment from Charity, but for Dr. Ruth, when I was his uh, help, helper, assistant at the D-Men program at United Theological Seminary, and uh, probably he's had more influence theologically on me than anybody else. And uh, Craig is another one who's had, Craig, Dr. Craig Keener has had great influence on me as well, but not as much as Dr. Ruthman. And uh, I am I'm just... Uh, Remember taking the courses and li listening to the influence in my own teaching. It was like going from classroom to the world and taking things that I was learning and so deeply in touched by and impressed with and hearing that new information, that new insight coming forward as I was teaching in uh, all over the world. Um, so... And we, when we look at this, we're going to have, as I said, in the future, we'll have apostolic leaders on of large networks of churches. We're going to be asking them a lot of the questions about their practice and what their views are. Uh, and, of course, uh, they would say this is what they how they understand the Scriptures. But there's a difference between how people may understand mm -hmm. the Scriptures and what the Scriptures actually say. And sometimes they, they're together and sometimes they may not be sometimes the inter personal interpretation may not be what others would agree with. So we'll try to look at that. We'll also be looking at some of the major accusations, which uh, I think for, as someone first person told me back in the night, in the 1940s, he got in trouble in the movement he was in. And he said, I'm sure some of what the accusations were, somebody had to be saying that or we wouldn't have been accused of it. But what we were accused of the majority of us in the movement didn't actually believe that. And I think that's the case in uh, this present situation, which we find ourselves with some of the critics of the New, Affirma New Apostolic uh, Reformation, that I'm sure that there may be some people who hold some of those views and have some of those attitudes. But so far in my research, and actually uh, you guys don't know this, but I actually did a survey of 30-some-odd um, or more uh, people who are apostolic leaders, and some of them were responding for uh, uh, many, many churches that they oversee. And I found out that there was a great difference between what these key leaders actually believed and what they were uh, accused of believing for being a part of what's said to be the new apostolic reformation. So, um, was, we just want to begin by saying there is a lot of controversy over this. And uh, I believe that C. Peter Wagner is the person who actually coined the phrase, the New Apostolic Reformation. And I'm not asking you guys to comment on your opinion of the New Apostolic Reformation or trying to respond to the critics. We want to really try to keep you focused in uh, or we want to gain from your knowledge as biblical scholars. And so we just want to approach this from not uh, apart really from the controversy, though it will have an impact on it. We want to approach it from, this is what the Scripture says. And uh, so we want to, uh, we have some questions for you. Uh, and I really feel that as a result of our time together and the other people we'll have on, I do think that there will be more understanding and less controversy and a little more unity and greater respect for the diversity that's in the church. So... Uh, Charity, would you like to make the formal introductions? Sure. So today we have with us uh, Dr. Craig Keener. Dr. Keener has his Ph.D. from Duke University. He's the F.M. and Ada Thompson Professor of Biblical Studies at Asbury Seminary. He's a New Testament scholar on Bible background. He's an award-winning author of over 30 books, and he's ordained by the National Baptist Convention. So, And then we also have with us Dr. John Ruthven. 
Uh, Dr. Ruthven has his PhD in religious studies uh, from Marquette University. He teaches at the Global Awakening Theological Seminary. He's professor emeritus at Regent University. And he's the author of On the Cessation of the Charismata, um, the preeminent defense of the continuation of spiritual gifts. And I know um, some reviews would say it's the theological classic on the topic. And it's an honor and privilege to have you guys on with us. I know one time a great a trustee, I know I interrupted you there, Charity, but I wanted to say <laughs> this little bit of a personal side. I don't know if John knows this or not, but there was a trustee of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary where I got my master's from, and he was uh, slated to do a uh, debate with the president of the Southern Baptist Convention on the cessation of the charismata, on the subject of have the gift, certain gifts ceased. And uh, he contacted uh, you, John, to ask if he could have permission to quote you and use your sources. And you said, of course you can. And then you said, I'll even volunteer to be there with you. And when the president of the Southern Baptist Convention at the time was the other person in the debate heard that you were going to be there, he said, I, I'm I, I won't be part of that. If John is going to be there, uh, I'm, I'm just not going to, we're not, we're not going to do it. So, uh, I, and I had other people tell me that your book is the gold standard that deals with the question of the uh, cessation of the charismata. So, Charity, sorry for interrupting you, but I thought just a little bit of a personal <laughs> thing there might interest our listeners and watchers a little better. Yeah, that's wonderful. And then just a, a quick introduction of you, Randy. We, I have uh, Dr. Randy Clark with us, Doctor of Ministry from United Theological Seminary and the President of Global Awakening Theological Seminary. Thank you. And Charity is one of our premier students and scholars and a budding future scholar, theologian, biblical studies. <laughs> she loves revival, though, more than anything. So. I do. I love Jesus and, and I love revival. Loves Jesus and loves revival. So... What is the New Apostolic Reformation? Just very quickly, that's a term Peter Wagner gave to a group of churches that believes that the offices, the Doma gifts of, first, of uh, Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 13, uh, have continued, and that there are uh, apostles and prophets, as well as evangelists, pastors, and teachers that are to be involved in the life of the church. Uh, the critics would say very strongly governing the church, um, and I would like to say that most of the people I've talked to so far has um, a view of servant leadership rather than domineering uh, a general that's barking orders. That was not I, what I found in the survey that I've done with uh, some key leaders of very large apostolic networks. However, having said that, I'm sure there's some that might represent and do represent this more negative uh, uh, view. And when we're defining it, we're trying to say this is what the accusations are and this is what some people's problems are. And so uh, having clarified that, we want to see just, just how much authority did the uh, apostles have? This is one of the questions I'm going to be asking you guys. Uh, from the biblical New Testament, uh, did, did they... What kind of authority did they have, and did they have only limited authority? Was it only the authority in the churches they started, or was it? Did they have authority seen to be over all the churches? Uh, um, was there qu sometimes questions of how much, uh, even if they had any authority? And so that would be one of the questions we have, and and just the nature of apostle. And and John, this is one I will direct to you later. Is you know were the apostles aware that they were primarily writers of Scripture, or from the New Testament itself, it does seem like they might have perceived themselves differently. And we will want to talk about uh, one of the big subjects is from the New Testament. Do you see, and Craig, it's the same question I want to ask you later. These are three questions that we'll bring up. Do you see that there are differences between the apostles of Christ and the apostles of the church? Are there differences between the twelve and then the others that are uh, uh, titled by Paul, um, apostles in the in the New Testament, and if so, what would be some of the differences? So, uh, I, and I think uh, as we as we look at it, those will be some of the, another question or accusation is the relationship with the prophets. Is the prophets are like uh, secret intelligence agents 
This is some of the critics of the language they're using, and uh, they must govern with the apostle and are believed to possess extraordinary authority as, as Old Testament prophets had and extend this authority over individuals, churches, and nations. Even though that's what the critics said, I have to say I haven't met a prophet like that yet. And I've been running these circles now for about 35 years, and I've never really met one that's claimed those uh, those things. Every, matter of fact, everyone I've met has claimed that what I say is must be judged by Scripture. And uh, But I'm sure somebody must have said it, like I said, uh, to get accusations. But sometimes the accusations are just from a very poor representation or a lack of knowledge of, uh, of enough people to get, bring balance to it. Um, so we we will want to talk about do uh, today's prophets have the same authority as Old Testament prophets from the Scripture? You guys, we're asking you, what do you think from the Scriptures? Um, um, who are the others that weigh prophetic words? The question I would have there is, is the others who are to weigh the words that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 14, 29, are they the other prophets in the gathered meeting? Uh, is or are they the other people, the, the, congr the, the gathering in the house church they would have had then? Uh, or, you know, the question is, who are the others? And uh, then, then one question, of the accusation, 2 Corinthians 20.20, 20, is it applicable today? Or 2 Chronicles 20.20, 20, is it applicable today? Believe as prophets and you will succeed. Uh, again, I haven't had it. I don't know, Charity, have you heard anybody make those claims? Now, we have a lot of prophetic friends and prophetic people. And uh, What is it, 13 years you've been with Global Now? or 14, going four, on 15. Yeah. Going on 15 years that you've been with us. Uh, um, have we had anybody that's had that attitude? I can't think of uh, someone. I, 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 I was surprised when I read what they say we say. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. And then one of the other things, uh, well, two other things that we want to deal with is this whole I issue of healing and miracles. Uh, we're accused the pursuit of signs and wonders and miracles relates to the end time miracle working army. Now, this is drawing back to the influence of latter rain. Uh, this is what the, the uh, accusation is about. And in the future, I hope to have our friend uh, Michael McClyman on. I hope I can get him on because he's taken a leave of absence from his post as a uh, leading professor at uh, St. Louis University, a Jesuit school, and that's exactly what he's wanting to study is all going back to the beginning of Pentecost up to now, this whole aspect of, of the revelation uh, or receiving direction from God and looking at the healings and uh, just looking at this, this movement. Uh, but anyway, that deals with um, the end time army, and if you it's like manifest sons of God, they wouldn't get sick; they'd be alive when Jesus came. Um, I know somebody taught that, or they wouldn't have been accused of it. But they all died, so obviously that was wrong. Uh, they're not alive right now. However, um, I, I do think it'd be interesting in, in all of your reading, and I know this is, we're going to have church historians on and later we can deal with that, but it seems like going all the way back to when uh, uh, Napoleon's reign and the, the, uh, they coronated a prostitute in Notre Dame University as the goddess of wisdom and tried to change the calendar, just pretty much secularized France. And the Pope was ran out of uh, into hiding. That from that point there was a consistency, or at least an interest, in prophecy that was renewed, because they saw that as the abomination that makes desolate. And there was a new emphasis on the prophetic um, understanding of last times, and even Spurgeon in the eighteen. 47, I think it was, uh, talked about that. believe that there's a great end time, a revival coming like we haven't seen before. And, uh, of course, in 49, there was a great revival that hit England and in, in that area. Uh, and that was less than 60 years from Pentecost. But there was this understanding based upon that uh, scripture that in the end times, and Jonathan Edwards had this as well, in the end times, there'd be a great revival. And the Great Revival would have a, a restoration of the gifts that had been um, 
perceived to be have ended, that they would be restored, and even the, some, for some, that there would be a restoration of uh, the all the offices of Ephesians or the gifts of Ephesians chapter uh, four. Uh, and so, when it comes to this healing and miracles. Some of the questions to think about, it, is there a biblical basis for the laying on of hands and imparting gifts of the Holy Spirit? Um, I have an opinion on that, as you might expect. Uh, should we expect miracles to be normative today? That's a question that I'd like to get your opinion from, from not our experience, but from the New Testament and what they would have thought. Should this be normative that they're in the life of the church? Is it a normative thing? Now, in the sense of let me give some clarity so we're on the same page. I heard someone who was a critic of mine on the radio one time. He said, I am a charismatic. I believe that healing is possible today. I believe that the gifts of the Spirit are possible today. And particularly with healing and miracles, it is possible. I'm a charismatic. I believe it. But I believe it's wrong to believe that we should expect them to be normative. Now, for me, normative is very regular. That means uh, I went through 14 years of experience of pastoring where I see, I saw five people get healed in 14 years, and I was praying for healing. It wasn't normative. I was shocked when somebody got healed. But for the last 25, 30 years, I would be shocked if we had a meeting and went for healing and nobody got healed. So it was a, it was a regular thing, and normative in that sense, that it's not rare that that would be quite often we would see. Now, does that mean everybody's getting healed? Rarely. I haven't seen that. Matter of fact, I've never seen that when everybody in a meeting got healed. I have been in two meetings where everybody, after a certain period of time, that everybody that was praying, everybody that got prayed for, got healed. One time it was after midnight, another time it was after 10. But prior to that, it was difficult. You know, something switched. Uh, so, and then the last thing, I have some more questions on that, but the last subject is um, strategic level spiritual warfare is associated with this movement in AR. However, a lot of people that's in AR actually don't practice that, um, including myself. Um, but I did go to Argentina and interviewed the main proponents of strategic level spiritual warfare and uh, would just like you know, your perspective as is there a biblical um, merit for some of the concepts in strategic level spiritual warfare. So I'd like to come back and let's start with the um, issue of the should we expect the Doma gift? Then that's the word used in first for our watch, <laughs> watchers in the Ephesians 4 uh, to exist today. And I'd like to ask, uh, or I'd like to make a statement. I actually don't feel like I'm a restorationist in this, which one of the things is that it's a belief, the NAR believes that these functions of apostle and prophet had ended and they have been restored in the last, uh, particularly for like the 80s and 90s. Uh, I actually do not believe that. I believe that they never ended. I believe that uh, it became politically incorrect to speak of apostles because the early church wanted to make a distinction between the 12 and, uh, and honor that position. And so they made the bishops successors to the apostles, which is really interesting because a lot of the issues that bishops were to do, such as laying on of hands for stirring up and activating gifts, still to this day is a part of the theology of the work of the bishop. Governing was very much a sense of the work of, of bishop. And so I just believe, for example, I think it was uh, Scott McDermott, who has a Ph.D. in New Testament, he recently sent me a picture of John Wesley's gravesite. And on his tombstone, it, it, it has apostolic that he in his own perception of himself, it, at least he's got it on his tombstone. It was apostolic. So I believe that these gifts continued even though they did. we didn't refer to them with that title, but the function was still there. So what's your opinion? I defer to Craig. Oh, uh, I think <laughs> uh, uh, four-volume 
masterpiece on the book of Acts, which for my money is the absolute definitive work on the subject and will probably remain so for for civil future. Uh, and uh, I think we ought to, it, it, one, of the, one of the problems I think we can blow away immediately uh, using biblical concepts is the idea of the end times. And Craig, uh, what is the period of the end times according to Acts? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Peter, um, in, in Acts two seventeen, he paraphrases um, Joel, Joel chapter 2, where it says uh, afterward, but he knows the context of it. And in the context of it, afterward means in the last days. Peter talks about what's happening right then. In the last days, says God, I'll pour out my spirit. Your sons and daughters will prophesy and so on. So we've been in the eschatological era. And this is actually throughout the New Testament where it uses last days, last times, uh, and so on. We've been, we've been in that period since the day of Pentecost. That's right. That's right. I should say that the, the old dispensationalists, you know, I, I was raised as a, as a Schofield Bible dispensationalist. We used to sing that hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Schofield's Notes and Moody Press. <laughs> and uh, we... Uh, uh, we grew up with this idea of the last days as being this snippet that we find ourselves in now. And they described it as the former and the latter reign. The former reign was the time of Pentecost in the first century, the time of the apostles and all the miracles and healings. And then they went through the dark ages, uh, the dark dry times, that's good Protestant thinking. And then they ended up in the, the, the uh, 1900s, uh, where the spirit was beginning to be poured out uh, more, more visibly, at least in some people. Uh, and they called that the latter rain. So you had the former rain and the latter rain, and that in between time of the dark ages that are for you know, almost two, two uh, millennia was nothing. That's a pretty distorted idea, I think, of what the New Testament is trying to say, partly because it was a misunderstanding of rainfall in Israel. We get the former and the latter rain to the people who lived in Israel. That was a great thing. Why? Because the former rain started the rainy season off early, and the latter rain would stretch it out toward the end. And in Israel, it's like Texas, you could never get enough rain. And, uh, but the rain was continuous all through the rainy period from the former times to the latter times. All the former and latter rain meant was increased abundance, increased growing season, and more things grew better. The grape vines got more uh, water for the production of grapes later on that summer. This, the winter wheat uh, would be harvested in April or so, and, uh, but all during the winter, you'd get that lovely rain to, to sustain it. So we have a false model when we talk about former and latter rains in the, in the modern fundamentalist sense. Uh, it simply meant that God would begin early and end late, and in between, there'd be plenty of rain. So it's not... It's not the Dark Ages theory. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm, th I'm thinking of that passage. I read it in your book, John, uh, from Jeremiah, where he talks about the continuation of the miracles, which didn't fit even the, the view of, of uh, dispensationalists. Said, uh, the miracles only occurred in times of revelation and doctrinal revelation that Jeremiah was quoting it, they have continued up to this time, and which goes so well with what you've just mentioned. It was a, it was a time that it continued. It just wasn't right. these and he said, times. Even beyond that, he was saying, uh, you have performed signs and wonders in Egypt and have continued them unto this day, yeah. even among the nations. And so uh, 
it doesn't give you the picture of a former ladder rain kind of thing, or what they call the, the uh, C.S. Lewis called the great ganglions of history, where miracles appeared to accredit uh, the new revelation or whatever. That that theory is doesn't seem to really fit what God is doing. <clears throat> and I, I do think that um, there have been apostles through history. I mean, I, I think Wesley counts. Uh, Francis Asbury, who was one of the people he appointed, actually, in his writings, he speaks of this uh, apostolic ministry that, that we're doing. So it, it has been going on through history. And I think part of the, part of the issue, Luke, apart from, apart from uh, Acts 14, Luke largely restricts the title apostles to the 12, whereas Paul uses it more broadly. So 1 Corinthians 15 five through eight, he says, Jesus appeared to the 12 and some others, and then to all the apostles. Uh, he <laughs> speaks of James as an apostle in Galatians 1, 19. He speaks of, of course, himself as an apostle, and he speaks of Andronicus and Junia, according to the most, well, what I think is the most likely interpretation, Romans 16, 7 as apostles, uh, apparently speaks of Silas and Timothy as apostles. So he's using a broader definition than the 12. I mean, all of us are cessationists regarding the 12 in the sense that all of us believe the 12 have ceased. I mean, they're dead. <laughs> uh, they'll be resurrected, but, but in the meantime, they're not around. But in the broader sense that, that Paul uses it, there, there's no reason to believe that ceased. So in Revelation, you actually have both, both definitions. So you have the, uh, the, the, for the New Jerusalem, you have it built on the, the 12 apostles of the Lamb. But in Revelation chapter 2 in the church in Ephesus, he says, you tried those who were who claimed to be apostles. They were not the false apostles, which is also kind of what we're talking about, like with, you know, uh, the, the people who may be giving a bad reputation to others. But um, why would you have to test them if you knew that there weren't? <laughs> and the didache, which may be from the first century, the, the latest, it's early second century, is also talking about how you test apostles and prophets to make sure they're the, the real thing rather than the false thing. So there was a continuing understanding that that, that continued. Of course, Ephesians 4.11, uh, to bring the church to maturity, 4.11 to 13, the, the different gifts he mentions are apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers. And then Oh, I think in Revelation you also have uh, the expectation of the continuing apostles, maybe in chapter 18 or something. Um, I mean, there's no, I think a, the, the proper hermeneutic, the right way to approach the Bible is, you know, we see models for us in how God works. And if something, if something has ceased, we're more likely to, we, we shouldn't expect something to have ceased if we don't get direct um, biblical explanation. That yes. Otherwise, yes. we should expect it to continue. Exactly right. Um, I argue that you can count 89 apostles in uh, the New Testament, uh, the 70 or 72, whatever textual variant you go with, uh, were, were apostled in a verb form. They were sent out. Um, and I think the primary meaning of, of apostle is one who is sent out. It's the same word that we get in Latin as missionary, from missare, to send, to send out. And so it may be as simple as that. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the casting of, of the dice to select uh, the 12th apostle to replace uh, Judas. Um, I really wonder if Luke isn't taking a kind of shot at the apostles uh, who were in Jerusalem much later when Paul visited in the late 50s uh, to bring uh, uh, the collection, uh, received a pretty cool reception. And he says uh, they wanted to choose one who had been with them from the beginning. They wanted to make an exclusive group. Was this a shot at James, who was the head of the church when Luke was writing this? Um, or uh, was it 
a way of saying, look, we want to be the leading people after all. They had that controversy earlier in Jesus' ministry, who would be the chiefest among them and so on. And uh, so they got their 12th apostle, but the Spirit was poured out on the 120, a multiple of 12, which was the new Israel of God. Okay? And the punchline, for my money, of the Pentecost narrative about the coming of the Spirit and how it was, how the holiday of Shavuot, Pentecost, was fulfilled. I believe it was fulfilled in uh, uh, the, the new covenant pouring out of the Spirit on uh, from Jesus to his children, to his children's children forever. Peter's punchline is, uh, repent, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of your sins, and then you will receive the Spirit. The uh, Protestants, traditions, put the period at the end of baptized. And then you will receive the gift of the Spirit. For, and that simple little gar there, and Luke sometimes introduces a proof text. And I think Peter was citing a passage when he says, this promise is for you, uh, your children, and those who are afar off. I think that was a typical rabbinic way of shortening a, a longer quotation, which I believe came from Isaiah 59, 21. And it was the punchline of the Pentecost title. When the day, holiday of Shavuot, Pentecost, was fulfilled. I would argue that's the way that word should be translated. Uh, how was it fulfilled? This is my covenant with them, says the Lord. That's how that passage begins. The spirit that is upon you, just like the spirit was upon Jesus in Isaiah 61.1 in the programmatic statement of Luke, here we have the spirit upon you, singular, Peter doesn't use the singular, he uses plural you. But he goes on to say, upon you, Jesus, um, and the words I put in your mouth, prophetic words, remember Peter is yelling this out over the tongue speakers to the 3,000 crowd. Um, the words I put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth, nor depart from the mouths of your children, or, your child or from the mouths of your children's children, Adolam, forever. There's your former and latter rain thing. There's your last days thing, okay? But this gift of the Spirit, this which is the new covenant, you see, it's the mission of Jesus. Uh, when Jesus is introduced, you usually introduce someone by the most salient feature that they have. Like, for example, this is Dr. Craig Keener. Uh, he's the all-pro linebacker for the Seattle Seahawks, something like that. You see, <laughs> you take the most prominent uh, characteristic of the person. And also, in my opinion, the number one scholar in terms of quality on the planet. Anyway, we'll move on. <laughs> uh, the Where was I going? Um, Anyway, what's important here is that when Jesus is introduced, he's introduced not as the traditional Catholic Protestant, one who dies on the cross for your sins. He's the one who baptizes you in the Holy Spirit, which is the characteristic of the new uh, covenant, the words in the mouth, the prophetic utterance that demonstrates that the Spirit of God is upon you. We're not looking for evidence of the baptism of the Spirit here. We're saying that in 50, uh, uh, in uh, uh, over 85 percent of the contexts where the Spirit of God is mentioned in the Old and New Testament, 384 cases, over 85 percent of those contexts have descriptors that describe the Spirit either in terms of revelation, prophecy, or miracle, or power, you see. So when the Spirit was upon Jesus, these are the kinds of things you looked for. And when the Spirit comes upon people at Pentecost, that's the kind of thing you look for, you see, is a prophetic experience of some kind, you see. And so the, the critics 
of the charismatic movement, new apostolic movement. We say, oh, you concentrate on miracles and healings and, and prophecies and all that kind of stuff way too much. No, it is the core essence of what the new covenant is. Even the new covenant of Jeremiah is the direct revelation of God into the heart. You see, and that's what Peter, or uh, what yeah. uh, Paul picks up on in 2 Corinthians 3, is that no more on tablets of stone, but directly the Spirit working in your heart, speaking to you, as a, and making you a prophet, essentially. That is the defining feature. Uh, you know, when, when Paul was dealing with the uh, Ephesian uh, elders, or the, or the disciples of John in Ephesus, he asked the question, have you received the Spirit since you believed? In other words, this was a diagnostic question. It wasn't saying, I know you're a Christian or a believer, but did you receive the Spirit? Let's talk about that, a doctrine of subsequence. That wasn't what he was asking. He was asking, are you a Christian? Because Christians have this prophetic spirit. Okay? Yeah. Does that make sense, Craig? I mean, do you, I mean, I'm, we're talking to the world's expert here on Acts, so. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there may be some, when scholars get together, we can nitpick on, on details. So, like, I, I think that actually the, uh, the Twelfth Apostle, the Casting of Lots, I see that as parallel to the God sovereignly using the lots for Zechariah in Luke chapter 1. So, I see it as, as God sovereignly, you know, I, I think that they weren't doing something wrong in appointing the, the Twelfth Apostle. But, you know, the, those things are nitpicking, but on the general sense of what of what you're saying uh, in terms of prophecy I mean <clears throat> it happens all the way through scripture and so you know sometimes more than others some places more than others but you know the, the normal expectation should be you know why would we think it would stop and then in first Corinthians you know we're told three times well two times explicitly to seek the gift of prophecy you know I mean we have direct commands of scripture if 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 it weren't being practiced biblically today, we ought to pray that it would be like like the uh, in Acts chapter yes. four, uh, where they they pray that God will continue to grant them boldness through continuing to stretch forth His hand with signs and wonders, just like happened in chapter yes. three. Um, you know, we can we can pray for these things to happen more among us. We can, you know, we, we need all the members of the body of Christ. You know, there are certain churches I think they amputate. Um, certain parts of the body and then you have other churches that just pile up the amputated members you know we need we need all the members of the body um and and some people will object will say well you know we shouldn't have post-biblical doctrine so we shouldn't have post-biblical prophecy but i think teaching maybe maybe more of a danger with teaching introducing post-biblical doctrine because then that's not what prophecy is supposed to be you know, it's encouragement, exhortation, comfort, and so on. And uh, and I actually learned from Randy, whom I think who I think learned it from you, the the idea that this claim that um, the, the danger that having post biblical prophecy would introduce post biblical doctrine, the the idea that prophecy has ceased is itself a post biblical doctrine. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what, what part of the charismata and the calling of God are not withdrawn? What part of that is unclear, okay? <laughs> what part is unclear of it is the same God who energizes them all, everyone, referring to the list that he's just quoted of spiritual gifts, including apostles later on, yeah. uh, all in everyone. Now, does everyone have every gift? No, but the potential is there. And that's the promise that's offered there. Now, who did he write this to? The first century church? Or is this in the biblical canon that universal for everyone, the rest of us? Or do we have a cessationist canon? that that's for the first century canon, and then our canon is quite a bit shorter. Yeah. I'd like to redirect our thought just for a moment, because we're of interest of time and so much to ground to cover. Uh, 
In the Ephesians 4 passage, the function, and, and if I have got this wrong, you guys correct me because uh, you are my um, ones I look to to learn from as, as far as being the experts in the, the original languages and, uh, and theology and biblical studies. But anyway, Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, where it talks about, and when Christ ascended, he gave gifts to the church, some to be uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and, and teachers. Uh, and it goes on to say, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Now, in the King James Version, there was an unfortunate comma put in there for, for the equipping of the saints, comma. That's what the fivefold is for. They're to equip the saints, and they are for the work of ministry. But almost all the modern translations removed the comma, realizing that that was more or less probably from the historical context that the translators were in. And realize that the, those fivefold gifts, all of them together, are to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now, here's the question. I've been thinking about this, and I want to teach on it in the future. When we approach these five, or if the pastor teacher is one person, and there's, there's a division where it's one person, or if it's two different, what in what way does each one of those contribute to the equipping of the saints and what would be unique to the apostolic function or the prophetic function or the teacher function or the pastor or the evangelistic function so just in a, in a i know i i haven't read so much about this anywhere but i've wanted to think about okay if that's what they're for if we are not having in our church input from each of those then are we not losing something that God intended to be a part of our form of the believers in the church formation? So what is it, do you think, that the apostles offered, did, contributed to that equipping from the New Testament perspective? Greg? <laughs> John, you go first. <laughs> you, got that, you got that spiritual look about you. <laughs> Apostles, you know, there's nowhere in the New Testament where it's actually defined. And, and like we mentioned before, Luke and Paul kind of use, use the word in a different way. It's not contradictory, but they, uh, I guess you could call it complementary. Uh, but beyond the 12, in terms of how Paul uses it, it seems to me we have to kind of reconstruct that based on... Um, based on just how he uses it, what what there is in common among the, the people that he mentions, uh, where we can tell. And I, and I think there, well, there's certain things that are in common among all the descriptions of apostles in the New Testament where we have much information about them. They seem to be involved in breaking new ground, mm -hmm. as opposed to the false apostles in 2 Corinthians 11, who are just stealing other people's work, you know, and, and claiming credit for it. Well, we want to be in charge because we get your people over to follow us. Uh, that's a that's a dangerous thing. Those are false apostles. But people who are breaking new ground in, in various spheres, and I think that they they exercise a measure of authority, but it's not like an official local authority. So, for example, in Acts 15, you have... In Jerusalem, you have apostles and elders, the elders of the, I think, the local church. So it's not so much just an administrative function, but these are people who are specially authorized by God. Um, the, the sent, like Paul says, a called apostle uh, in describing himself, or an apostle by the will of God. You know, this isn't because I'm so, because I never persecuted the church or something. <laughs> this is because, you know, God called me to this. I didn't appoint myself, um, you know, and as far as others, well, it's whatever they see to be in me. I, I haven't, you know, I didn't run for the vote or something like that. Right. Um, but, but also a characteristic of them, there's signs and wonders. It's mentioned in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, and it's also mentioned in Matthew 10. But there, there's also almost always suffering, like Matthew 10, um, 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 2 Corinthians 11, uh, and actually he, he uses that to distinguish himself from false apostles. His calling costs him a lot. And, whoa, in terms of 
in terms of uh, what that means, I mean, when he talks in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, he says, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and then everything else. But in 1 Corinthians 4, he says, God has set forth us apostles last and, and talks about his sufferings there for, for the sake of spreading the gospel, which kind of fits what Jesus said, you know, whoever is yes. first will be yes. last. Yes, the servant will be greatest. So it's definitely a matter of servant leadership and people who are like, you know, I'm I'm this big apostle. You need to do what I say. <laughs> they are the antithesis of exactly. what apostleship should be. But but those who pour into God's people to equip God's people, uh, and of course that should be true for all of our callings. Uh, you know, um, I think what's in common among the the, the, the features in Ephesians 4.11, or one thing that's in common is they're ministers of, of God's message in, in, some, in some respect. Uh, and that God's word in various ways equips God's people to, to do their work as ministers to reach the world for Christ and so on. What's distinctive about apostles, it's not just the signs, it's not just breaking the, the ground. I mean, Philip, uh, the evangelist, did that in Acts chapter 8. Uh, he, actually, he was a forerunner of Peter in many ways, as has often been pointed out. But um, I guess it's the combination of these things, directly appointed by Christ, which I believe can still happen after the resurrection, as in, as in Paul's case. Um, and uh, so, it, I mean, it can be through the voice of the Spirit or whatever, but uh, it needs to be expressed in ways that are uh, servant leadership and breaking new ground for the kingdom. And I turn it over to John because, again, there's no specific definition, and a theologian may be able to uh, pull things together better than a mere... Yeah, I mean, why, why, <laughs> why are we even having this conversation about apostles today? Uh, historically, uh, the church, the Catholic church, uh, saw everybody, bishop and above, as an apostle. And the supreme apostle was the pope. And uh, in, the, in the heated polemics between Luther, the other reformers, and the Catholic church, um, they, in the heat of the moment, I believe, made a really bad biblical blunder about what an apostle was. And they simply said, no, you don't. And what, what, did, the, what did the Pope do, okay, as an apostle? He wrote encyclicals that were authoritative and binding on all the church, okay, uh, documents. And the other thing was that he had supreme authority, and so the reformers uh, simply took a 16th century pope and plunked the idea back down on top of the, old, uh, of the New Testament. And the apostles wrote scripture, and the apostles had total authority over the church. What they said went, which doesn't seem to go very well in Galatians when Peter, uh, you know, the first pope connected with Paul. Um, and so this is a terrible misconception where even Pentecostals who tend to be more Protestant than charismatic, uh, you know, have trouble with the idea of an apostle today because they write scripture and we can't do that today. And they have total authority over the church and we're Protestants and we don't buy that idea. So, uh, no apostles today. Well, if you take that nonsense out of the equation, you see, and examine how many apostles actually wrote Scripture, out of the 89, there may have been three. Peter, Paul, John, possibly Matthew, but it's not in the text that he did. You know, that comes from uh, Papias or something later on. Um so you got three apostles out of 89 writing scripture. The rest of them really fell down on the job. And there's probably more than 89. 
uh, you know, if they if they weren't writing scripture too. So is that endemic uh, to being an apostle? Um, and the other thing, of course, is the authority, and it was all kinds of things. I think when we talk about apostleship, and the, I, I shudder when I hear this fivefold offices. That you know, that's a totally later concept read back into that passage. They're not offices at all. They're their slave functions. You remember the context of Ephesians is that Jesus uh, uh, looted the kingdom of Satan and brought captivity captive and distributed them to his supporters, to the church, uh, just as a king would loot another kingdom and bring back a lot of loot and everything, but the prize was slaves. And then he would give his slave all those people as slaves to his supporters. Well, that models what being is what's being used there, and that process doesn't stop because he set apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and so on, mechri, until these following things happen. We all come into the full uh, measure of the stature of Christ. As far as I know, only Craig does that. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, one of us, anyway. Uh, and uh, unity of the faith, you know, if we're disagreeing over that, I mean, that hasn't happened yet. So those are the kinds of things that only seem to happen in heaven, you see. And that's how long these slave gifts have been, are going to be in the church, until these criteria are fulfilled. Yes. So based upon <clears throat> Timothy, Paul's writing to Timothy, both first and second, and uh, the book of Acts, uh, and in Romans, where, as John, you pointed out when I was in your class, 111, Paul wrote, I wanted to come to you that I might impart some spiritual gift to you. So we could say, based upon that passage in Romans, that one of the things that apostolic people did in their function was used to help activate or impart spiritual gifts. And, and I believe, my opinion, have a little bit of experience in that, is that it's not only through laying on of hands and, and uh, when the Holy Spirit sovereignly does it, because this is one of the, it, it's not just that, but it's also through teaching. I've seen, and this is where I really value the pastor teacher role uh, because if an apostolic person comes in and there's an activation and there's teaching and information and in the sense of that they brought because I believe that they also can teach um, but the, if, the, if that that's been planted isn't watered by the teaching of the local teacher pastor it doesn't go very deep and so it, and, and I think in, in, in my case, I remember when I just began to teach things before there was anything else, just the teaching of here's the way you can receive words of knowledge. Here's the way that, here's the way you can recognize the voice of God. The teaching alone was able also to activate. So I'm not, so what I'm saying is that it's not that this gift is the only gift through which activation can come, but it is, it is a, a um, a priority you see it more often and uh, and as 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 Craig pointed out the Acts eight Philip wasn't an apostle uh, at the time he you know he was seen as maybe a deacon became an evangelist but next to the apostles the evangelists were the ones that had to seem to see in the at least the book of Acts where you saw the most signs and wonders and yet I don't want to say that only apostles and the evangelists are the ones who could work God used for signs and wonders because in Acts 11, you've got the people, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem and the church has been scattered. And you pick up around verse 17 and they went to Antioch and the hand of the Lord was with them, which yes. is a Jewish euphemism for the power of God. And, 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 the, and the grace that was evident, I believe, is seen in the, the churches being formed. So you have people that are s sent and, you know, you send out two prophets or a prophet and a teacher in, in uh, Paul and uh, Barnabas, 
And as they go and as they win, it seems like they got a field commission. And for the first time, they're called apostles while they're out on that missionary uh, journey that they're that they're on. And it seems as if one of the things was they did have an authority to appoint leaders, elders in the churches that they started. It does seem like um, that was a unique type of a role. But and what's really interesting in when we talk about the the bishops today and like the Methodism and 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 the Catholic and Orthodox and other types of churches, there still seems to be that ability to have to appoint to charges or to churches or to places and and to move around, which seems to be an apostolic uh, type of function that I didn't don't see in some other places uh, with other uh, those slave gifts. Um, so that was one. The activation of gifts. Paul said to Timothy, to, uh, uh, "Not to fan and flame the gift of God that's within him through the laying on of my hands." Now that could have been his ordination, but I, I do think in First Timothy four fourteen that was probably his ordination. When it says about, uh, "Do not neglect the gift of God that's within you through the uh, prophetic word of the uh, when the body of elders laid their hands on you." It seems like. This was a function of uh, that sometimes it's more doctrine today than it, it was in, in the New Testament. It seemed like it's reality. My desire, and I've met with some bishops of uh, uh, churches, uh, at least one bishop in particular I'm thinking of now, who really wants to see a restoration of what his denomination says. These are the things that your actions should be accomplishing Theologically, and his struggle is, I want to see it experientially, phenomenologically. I really do want to see these things that I'm supposed to be doing happening, the evidence of them more than just the theology of it. So I think unless we recapture some of the uniqueness of these of the gifts, there isn't the aspiration to walk in it. Um, and and I yeah, and I yeah. and I think you know when we use the word pastor for everybody, everybody's pastor. That's the least mentioned office, and it's the most often used today. And uh, when I think of, uh, for example, Heidi and Roland Baker, mm-hmm. when I think of what they have done in Mozambique, and when I think of the suffering that's going on there, and particularly right now uh, with the martyrdom that's going on. Uh, with the, 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 the amount of suffering I know just personally from being a friend of theirs, they have gone through. It seems, and they would not like to, for people to call them apostles. Right. They wouldn't like to be called that. But when we talk about the little A, they're not one of the 12. But to think that, well, a pastor, or, or, or I think, uh, you know, Sometimes I think we got the big A apostles, the 12, we got the little A apostles, uh, and of course with Paul. And sometimes with people like Roland and Heidi, it seems like, man, they're just kind of like, it's almost like a big A slash little A because they are just really uh, the miracles, signs and wonders, uh, casting vision, establishing the church. Uh, literally involved in, but it's not top-down barking orders. That's you know, Mama Haida, Papa Roland. It's that servant thing. But it, but there is responsibilities. Paul talks about on a, above all these other things in First in Corinthians eleven and all the suffering he had. He's got the concern for the churches. Uh, I just yeah. feel like in this, as we're going forward, it, it, it the function. There needs to be more of an emphasis that these are valid New Testament functions that needs to be, people need more faith for today. Yeah. Yes, I think um, when we talk about signs of a true apostle okay. were worked among you with all patience, uh, we're not talking about miracles accrediting or proving that Paul was an apostle. Paul's point, I think, was a true apostle does what Christians do, which is to be filled with the Spirit and manifest God's revelation and power. Proof of that is this usually mistranslated uh, passage in Romans, 
where Paul summarizes what his mission is like. Yeah. Okay? Romans 15, he says, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. Yeah. Not because I have unique authority as apostle. To bring Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, which may be a kind of technical term for prophet, prophet and he, uh, miracle or, or mighty work. Jesus was mighty in word and deed. Okay, how? By the power, dunamis, of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Yugoslavia, Illyricum, and this is really crucial. This is where it gets mistranslated. I have fulfilled the gospel. Now, practically all of the translations following the Vulgate and the King James say, I have fully preached or fully proclaimed or fulfilled the ministry, the new ASV. It's a little closer, but still wrong. The word there is a verb. It is not an adverb, fully. It is a verb. It says, here's how I fulfilled the gospel. By the signs and wonders, spiritual gifts, and the power of the Spirit is the way the gospel characteristically works. Because everywhere I go, this is what I do. You see, this is normative, not normal in the sense of usual, but normative in the sense of prescriptive. So Paul fulfills not his ministry, not his preaching, but he fulfills the gospel by these things. In other words, the gospel is not simply a verbal phenomenon. You see, as the translators would, would do here, the gospel is the power of God unto healing. You say, wait a minute, that's supposed to be salvation. If you go through the synoptic gospels, almost 100% of the cases where that salvation word, soteria word is used in its family, it's referring to healing and physical rescue, even political rescue, or Jesus being rescued off the cross. Let him save himself. Uh, it's derivative to talk about going to heaven as salvation in this context, although it probably includes it. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Why wouldn't he be ashamed? Because he can say, look, I can point to God in action. God also bears witness with signs and wonders and mighty works and spiritual gifts distributed as he wills. That's a normative statement about how God presents the gospel. You see. I think John and for and critics to say, well, you're concentrating too much on miracles and signs and wonders. That's nonsense. The Bible itself says this is the gospel. The kingdom of God does not consist in yakety yak. It consists in dunamis, power, miracle power. Okay? Yeah. So that your face may not rest <laughs> on the wisdom of men, of eloquence, but on the power of God. I, I think uh, I'm not Craig coming here. He wants again, I know. he wants to say <laughs> something about. I was going to say, John, the ESV. I think it translates it uh, is the way you've just said. Uh, the, I have fulfilled the gospel. Well, AS, ASV, the old version, has it as a marginal note. Uh, the new e ESV has it fulfilled the ministry. Oh, okay. Yeah, Craig. Uh, <laughs> I, have, I have a whole bunch of notes here about, but some of them are miscellaneous by this point. But, um, but it is it is true the the good news when Paul summarizes the the good news that was shared by all of the apostolic movement, First Corinthians fifteen one and following, it has to do with Jesus died according to the scriptures, was buried, was raised the third day according to the scriptures, 
So there's the backstory according to the scriptures, and then Mark with the, the beginning of the good news, he's going to give you more of the backstory immediately of Jesus' ministry. Uh, but, you know, the, the summary of it was Jesus' death and resurrection uh, and the appearances and so on. But the way that it was demonstrated, it's like, um, well, it's the good news of the kingdom also, because, you know, Jesus wasn't going around saying to everybody, I'm the Messiah. Uh, so he talks about the good news of the, the promised restoration Isaiah talked about, you know, the good news, our God reigns. And that promised restoration would include the, the disabled walking and leaping for joy, the blind eyes seeing and so on. Jesus uh, quotes that in Matthew 11, 5 and Luke 7, 22 as, as signs to show John that, yes, he actually is fulfilling the, the work of the kingdom. George Ladd, <clears throat> I think, ma made a major uh, step forward when he was talking about how these things are, are demonstrations of the kingdom. And I think that's why, you know, we don't see Paul talking about it all the time in his letters to the churches. But when he's talking about the founding of the churches, like in, in, in Romans 15, you know, in, in terms of in the churches, they have the spiritual gifts for the continuing of these things. But in his ministry, when he talks about the founding of the churches, the breaking of new ground, uh, there, there we have it, like 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Romans 15, 19. Um, and uh, now to the miscellaneous, R Roland and, and Heidi absolutely, um, actually, uh, and Ananias is another example of God using somebody He's not officially an apostle in, in Acts chapter 9, although he is sent by, by Jesus for, for a mission there, but short-term mission. Um, <laughs> he lays, lays hands on, on Paul so that he can be filled with the Spirit and receive his sight, 917. And some people have also, and I, I'm, I'm attracted to this idea, um, they've, e even though I don't see them having a lot of signs and wonders in the, in the sense in which we usually speak of it, but some people have spoken of, Luther and Calvin themselves as apostles of the word, because they were breaking new ground in, in a sense. I mean, they made some mistakes, but <laughs> we can tell from Galatians 2, 11 to 14 that Peter did too. Some people might think it was Paul. I, I think since Paul's writing a new inspiration, his perspective is, is normative, but um, yeah, that, that probably catches up. Oh, no, no, one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> in in Romans, Romans 15, and I think we see this sort of also in, in 1 Corinthians. But one thing about apostles is that they lay foundations. Uh, they're groundbreakers. Yeah. And, and it's not just, I mean, when, when people speak of apostles and prophets, uh, certain kinds of prophets at least, laying foundations for uh, the church universal, you know, maybe talking about the 12 or whatever, but uh, in Romans 15, laying a foundation in a new area, Paul wanted to go... Uh, lay foundations where they hadn't been laid already to break new ground. And so, um, I, yeah, that's why I, I spoke earlier about seeing them in terms of breaking new ground. Um, I would, would add that in Paul's churches, I don't think he wanted the fire to cool off. Okay. 40% of the prayers in the epistles are for spiritual gifts. I pray night and day that you will be filled with all wisdom and knowledge and understanding, revelation gifts, and power, like the power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. He wanted that kind of stuff in his church because that's what he prays for. I mean, uh, that was where he was focusing, was on the expression of the new covenant spirit. If you're in that new covenant, this is the way it ought to go. You see, and in First uh, Corinthians 11, which most commentators take a meat cleaver and cut it off from chapters 12 through 14, but First Corinthians 11 is organic with that. And what's at stake here is the the Eucharist of, of Jesus, the the sacrifice of Jesus, and he says, if you don't discern the body. Uh, that is why many of you are weak and sick and have fallen asleep. Why would he say that? And what is the body? A dozen verses later, 
you are baptized by one spirit into one body. In other words, charismatic functions embodied in people. And they were the ones who were being, you know, kicked out as freeloaders into the agape meals and, you know, get out of here, you're poor, you're, you know, you're not the elite, you're not the, you know, speaking mysteries in tongues. And they didn't discern the body. And Paul's really upset because that broke the covenant. You see, it denied the spiritual gifting that God had placed in that body. And as a result of breaking that covenant, they suffered covenant curses. You are weak, sick, and some of you have fallen asleep. Okay? In, in Hebrews, which I believe is a really charismatic book, uh, trying to stimulate hearing the voice of God again. Uh, you know, today when you hear his voice, three times it's mentioned, therefore do not refuse the one who is speaking because of the new covenant who has come. The criterion, the criterion for falling away we say blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the unpardonable sin. What does that mean? It means the revelation of God trying to communicate with you, and if you cut that off, there's no hope for you anymore. Okay? Same in Hebrews. And uh, I should get this exactly right. Um, I'm sorry, I should have had this up. Um the, the, fall, the famous falling away passage is always, endless ink has been spilt in Protestantism about can you or can't you fall away. But I don't think that's really the point. The point is this. Um, for it is impossible in the case of those who have, now listen, here's five characteristics of God's new covenant revelation have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, have shared in the Holy Spirit of prophecy and power, have tasted the goodness of the Word of God. We always think of that as scripture, it's prophecy. And the powers of the age to come, tasted of those things. And then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm by holding them up to contempt. Why? Paul says, I don't, I'm preaching in power because I don't want to empty the cross of its power. What did he mean by that? Jesus died on the cross to bring us to abrogate an old covenant curse, that's what all of his healings were about, was reversing the old covenant curses that, that people had fallen into. And now he's bringing them to a place where they come into a new covenant, which is the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. But it couldn't happen without the mediation of the cross, the new covenant. The new covenant is not Jesus dying on the cross for your sins. That mediates the new covenant. The new covenant itself is the coming of the Spirit of God. And that's what this verse says. If you negate, deny these different, repeated five times, uh, the work of the Spirit in your heart, and you deny that, there's no hope for you. It's over. Because Jesus is not going to die on the cross again to restore you to a new covenant. It's over. Now, does that mean later on you can hear and come to God? Yeah, okay. But to deny God's voice is the absolute core of the new covenant, both in Jeremiah 31, 33 and Isaiah 59, 21. It's the essence of what it is to be a Christian, is to have the presence and the Spirit of Jesus in you. Thank you, John. 
<laughs> Craig, I'd like your feedback on that. <laughs> well, I mean, I, Gordon Fee really emphasizes that, and it's there. I mean, it's in Paul's, it's in Paul's writing. It's elsewhere. It's like you said, and you know, he comes to baptize us in the Spirit. That that the experience of the new covenant. What's distinctive about it? I mean, the Old Testament, you had the Spirit coming on prophets, but with the new covenant, you know. All your sons and daughters are, are prophets. All of us have a relationship with God. Now, the word, of, the word of the Lord in the Old Testament is normally either the Torah or the message of the prophets. In the New, in the new Testament, well, when I say Old Testament, New Testament, those are the, just the language that we use. They, 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 they report the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. But, um, but for the, what we call the New Testament, the... <clears throat> the experience of the Spirit, the experience of a personal relationship with God is, is supposed to characterize believers. The word of the Lord I see in the New Testament most often refers to the, the message of the gospel, the good news, uh, which we're empowered by the Spirit to preach. And it, it's true also prophecy is still the word of the Lord. Obviously, Scripture is the word of the Lord. I think the most common usage in the New Testament is for the, is for the preaching of the gospel. Um, what I see with Scripture, it's not the only thing God ever spoke. Because, I mean, you've got, oh, you know, if you have two or three people prophesying per service, at least two or three uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, prophesying per service, per house church throughout the first century, you've probably got like 700,000 prophecies or so there. With the Old Testament, you know, uh, Jezebel is killing the prophets of the Lord. Obadiah he hides a hundred of them by fifties in the cave, First, first Kings 18. Uh, you know, there are lots of things that God spoke that are, aren't in Scripture. That The point of Scripture is it's a measuring stick. It's what we use. It's normative. It's what Absolutely. we do to Absolutely. evaluate other, other claims. So, um, so this isn't, yeah, it's just... Because I know sometimes when we say something, people say, "Ah, oh, you're you're not saying this." You right, say right, right, all. right. No, I would <laughs> I would agree. Yeah, yeah. ten times sure people understand we we agree with those other things too. <laughs> yeah, ten times the Spirit of God in the New Testament is seen revealing Scripture, hmm. and so kind of one is the other. It's the Word of God written, I would say. Hmm. Well, yeah. gen gentlemen, uh, famous scholars. We only have 36 minutes left, a little over that, and I, I need to move us along a little bit. I appreciate everything you're sharing. It's really, really interesting and exciting, but I want to focus on uh, the apostolic's relationship to healing and miracles and uh, have just four questions, and, it, and I think we can have uh, rather shorter answers on them because they're pretty direct. <laughs> uh, this is your opinion based upon your reading of Scripture. Is there a biblical basis for the laying on of hands and imparting gifts of the Holy Spirit? Now, I'm not going to limit it as only apostles can do that. I'm just, just, is that something that you see in Scripture that is a biblical, there's a biblical basis for that? <coughs> Se 2 Timothy 1.6 uh this, in this case, from the New American Standard, for this reason I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So, uh, John, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, it seems to come in all kinds of different ways. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, when did the Spirit come vis-a-vis -vis hearing the gospel in Acts? Is there a pattern? There's a pattern, all right. There's no pattern. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, go ahead, John. But um, as far as laying on of hands to impart and so on, sure, you can do it any way you want. Uh, the The command in, in in Corinthians is to desire the gifts, and it doesn't say how you're going to get them. Uh, it just seems that the Holy Spirit's going to do it one way or another, and that the ritual or the uh, means is secondary i believe yeah I, even when i teach on this i you, you see in the old testament and the new testament 
impartation and activation, both without the laying on of hands and with the laying on of hands, sometimes through the key uh, leaders, the apostles or, or Moses, and sometimes through others or, or a prophet. Um, for example, Ananias, who laid his hands on uh, Saul, who came, became Paul. Uh, he wasn't an apostle. He's called just a, a disciple. But second question, uh, should we expect miracles to be normative today? And I want to use the word normative, not that everybody you pray for gets healed or there's a miracle every time you pray, but it's it's not rare. What's your thought? Craig? <laughs> um, no? Yes, as long as you define normative the way you just defined it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And if you would like I, to take I a minute mir- just to miracles explain. Miracles are normative in the sense that they are the gospel. They don't prove the gospel, they express the gospel. And in that sense, they may not be normal, but they are normative in that they are prescriptive from Scripture. The, the restoration that Isaiah talks about and Jesus demonstrates when he's healing people, they're a foretaste of the, of the promised coming kingdom. So, um, you know, we don't get our resurrection bodies right. when we're prayed for, but, we, but healing is a foretaste of, of that. Yeah. And using the language of Ladd and of John Wimber that I worked with, served under, uh, the kingdom now, not yet. Is a is a part of this. It's it's now, but it it's not every time we ha- pray, every time we lay hands on people. That that's the not yet aspect. You know, there's still going to be sickness and problems until Jesus comes back and this Perusia, and when he comes back at the, at the end and things, the kingdom's consummated. Uh, another question: Do you believe in an end time army or Joel's army that will be so empowered by God that they manifest God so powerfully they will not be subject to sickness, disease, or death, and will live just before the second coming of of Christ? Do you think there's any biblical basis for that belief? In terms of a spiritual army, I mean, we're we're called to you know put on the armor of God and so on. I mean, there's a lot of uh, language like that in the New Testament, but in terms of what you're talking about, um, I think you may have mentioned earlier you you didn't meet some some of the people who taught this, but I actually have run into some of the people who were manifested sons, believers, and I actually could feel. I mean, in terms of discernment of spirits, I actually could feel spirit of Antichrist in that. Um, it, it, it takes the, it takes the focus off of Christ, who's the head of the body, yes, and puts us in His place, and I think that's that's really dangerous. Thank you, John. You have an army of God that, without without death and without sickness, you may have an army of God, but I think that'll be after the parousia in heaven. Yeah. All right, but on short of this side of His coming back. You don't expect there's. You don't see a biblical basis for that belief. Well, as as long as we agree over Paul's thorn in the flesh being bad eyes, um, uh, then then that would that ideal state would not hold. I don't think. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think it's bad eyes. I actually think it was the persecutions he faced. It's, it's <laughs> Numbers thirty-three fifty-five. But yeah, I'm, that, I'm, <laughs> John, I'm going to side with Craig on this one. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, I knew you would. <laughs> <laughs> but, but do, in your eyes. <laughs> I do think Galatians four thirteen probably. I mean, it obviously speaks of a bodily weakness, and and so I mean, Trophimus I left at Miletus sick. Second Timothy four. I mean, we do have. Yeah. People are still sick in this age. Obviously, I mean, you have a lot of great people of faith from the 19th century, like Hudson Taylor and George Mueller and so on, but they're not still alive. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually heard people say this. If Paul had the revelation of faith that we do today, uh, he wouldn't have left Prophemus sick in Miletus. It says we have a better understanding of faith than he did. I totally, you know, disagree with that. But because I'm running out of time, I don't want to chase that rabbit. Uh, uh, because this is a section that deals with the apostolic relationship to healing and miracles that's uh, been 
written about by uh, some critics, and 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 this is one that's really related to even my ministry, where it says that. Uh, uh, they say that people in the New Apostolic Reformation emphasize that we can teach people to move in the miraculous. And is this really part of Ephesians 4.11? I want to, I want to give my opinion on it and let you guys go. I, don't, I think I've been misunderstood. I think uh, my friends have been misunderstood. We, have, we do have schools of supernatural schools of healing and um, miracles. We do have schools that are four days long. We go out and we actually talk about training and teaching. But behind it is an understanding that we can't do anything. This is a sovereign work of God, and it's not a human work. It's not our hands that cause it. We, you know, when you lay your hands on somebody and nothing happens, you say, I saw what I can do. I lay my hands on this person over here, and they, all of a sudden miracles start happening in their life. I saw what the Holy Spirit can do. And there really is a difference. It's, 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 and we're misunderstood in the, in the sense of thinking we can teach information alone. Now, if the information brings about an understanding, an inspiration or revelation of a, a clarity of how things work, then it's, it's helping with faith. And the Holy Spirit's behind that. But I, I just wanted to go out on this and say we, are not, we really don't believe we can teach people how to move. It's, it's a sovereignty. It's the same way about preaching the gospel. You preach the gospel, some people come under conviction, and some people don't. We don't have any control over that. There, that's a, a, something that it's a it's a moving and working of God. And uh, just just your opinion, real quick on that. What what's your thoughts as far as can we teach people to move in the miraculous in the sense of uh, in, a, in a naturalistic way? No, not in the naturalistic way. <laughs> no. <laughs> in, the, in the gift, I mean, in the gift of teaching, I mean, John and I both teach in doctoral programs. And so a lot of the students were teaching, well, at least in my case, um, most of my PhD students are going to be teachers. And so th there's a modeling there, there's a mentoring there that occurs. Um, and also, like with evangelism, um, it's not just because it's for equipping the saints in Ephesians 4.11, this isn't just, you know, um, if, if somebody who just evangelizes directly. I mean, as a young Christian, I would, I would, I would do that. I would uh, share, share Christ with people. A lot of people came to Christ as I shared, shared Christ with them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but sometimes also the new believers, I take them with me to share Christ. Yeah, uh, and and so they would they would also uh, become a part of this and be, uh, and and the same with the gift of prophecy. I mean, again, you can't guarantee somebody's going to get the gift, but you know it does say to seek it, and you can encourage people to seek that. You can you can teach them about what the Bible says about the gift, and you know um, also you can be in you can help people to be in situations where they experience that. So. 1 Samuel chapter 19, I mean, starting with 1 Samuel 3, word of the Lord was rare, visions were infrequent in those days when Samuel was a boy, but by the time he's, he's a grown-up, you know, there's prophets running around, and you get to 1 Samuel 19, you see Samuel presiding over the, this group of prophets, and the Spirit of the Lord is so strong in that place that some, some people come, even who are not being godly, and they fall down. That, that also should tell us something about... Uh, the gifts are different from the fruit, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but you know, the third Lord is so strong in that place that that they start prophesying. So we can we can be agents of um, facilitating um, and be uh, catalysts in a sense for helping helping people to grow in this and, and move in move in the gifts. Exactly. I remember uh, our first uh, cohort coming through in our D-Men program, where it was all about healing and works of the Spirit and so on. And uh, I remember in the dissertation defense, where in each case they were testing a teaching program for its effectiveness in training people to do healing. And in all three cases, at the beginning of the defense, they expressed dismay at the fact that they hadn't got the first lesson out 
But some of these newbies who'd never done this before in their life were seeing people getting healed all over the place. And they hadn't had the instruction yet. You know, you don't know how to do this. And they were genuinely dismayed at that. And I was laughing, you know. After four years of working with people in this healing track, in the demon program, I came away with more questions than answers. But one of the answers I came with, away with is how do you get people to do healing? You tell them, practice, practice, practice. That's all I can tell you. Just keep doing it. <laughs> That's right. Pray. <laughs> just do it. Uh, and And we just couldn't rely on a technique or whatever we could we could talk about the ethics of healing and what to do and not to do and so on but you know how you hold your mouth and how you shout you know come out come out and all that sort of stuff you know we didn't you know we didn't get into that uh, <laughs> and i think also the fact that people are attracted to something i think god's putting in their heart mm. and so if someone signs up for uh, a healing school i think it's already because the holy spirit has been putting a hunger a desire in that which is some of the sovereignty side and then they respond to it sure. and i'm not taking away anything from the teachers because as i started out earlier uh uh craig and, and john i really see this connection between apostolic and local pastor it, that it's things that are uh, pioneered things that are new and things that are uh, and, and they really can build faith and there's an anointing that can be that's on people's lives but then there has to be that sharing of the word and the foundations of the word and continuing to sow into that to, to, in a regular pastoral preaching you know if you don't preach on healing you're not going to see a lot of healing in your church and and, and yes. the teaching that is just not for evangelists to heal and it's just not for apostles that you know it's the actual teaching that can help people's understanding to come in to have more faith but there is an there is as the spirit determines there is people as and as Wimber talked about everybody gets to pray just do the stuff as John was saying just uh, John uh, Ruth was just saying just go out and do it practice 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 but there's also the aspect of sovereignty Yes, that there will be some that will be perceived are all do all have gifts of healing and do all work miracles. The answer is implied to be no, but everybody can see healing as they minister, but they're not going to be seen as in that's a special thing on your life. But I think there are and what it is in same way with evangelists and, and prophets, everybody can prophesy, but not everybody's going to be a prophet. Everybody can evangelize, share the gospel and see things happen, but not everybody's going to be, quote, and evangelists because there's such a grace and anointing on their life for that. And I, I, I always struggled because I thought in the vineyard, for example, that Wimber was trying to bring a balance from a classical Pentecostal view of the, of the particularly after the uh, 48 healing revival, um, of the healing in the office of the healing evangelist. Yes, uh, bring, yes, yes. Bringing, a, bringing a balance to it's, so, so this is sure. constituted gifting, this constituted gift of healing, and he would say situational gift of healing. As you just your plumber shows up without any tools and whatever you need, God gives it to you in that moment as you're as you've shown up. And sometimes when you're trying to bring a balance to what has been an overemphasis, it can sound like you don't you no longer believe in what the overemphasis was. And my perspective is that both of these are true. Some and, and not that the person with constituted gift, anybody they pray for is everybody's going to get healed at all. There's still an aspect of sovereignty in it, but that every Christian is part of being a Christian should pray for the sick and they need to be taught about what the word says. Same way with evangelism. If you change it yeah. from healing to evangelism, you'll be more successful if you've taught people better about how to see, understand the work of God. If somebody's crying when you're sharing the gospel, that's a good sign. Yeah. You know, there's things that we can teach, but they're dependent upon the work of the Spirit, and it's helping people to understand that. Exactly. Charity, I'm going to let you, you I just, you, you need to get in on, on this before we run out of time. we got 20 minutes left. <laughs> uh, go ahead, ask whatever is on your heart. Or make a comment, whatever. 
Well, I, I think one thing I was wanting to ask, because I took your class on renewal theology and really was looking into the role of the prophets today, and some of the um, the statements were really about what the role of, well, even can there be prophets, but then also um, what is their role in church governance, in leadership? And so uh, one of the statements that was made by some of the critics is that there is no biblical support to say that um, the pro prophets should be in church governance and leadership. And so I wanted to get your opinion on that. Do you think there is a biblical support um, that prophets can be in leadership? As far as can be in leadership, I mean, you have Acts 13.1, where there were certain uh, the leaders of the church in Antioch were prophets and teachers. Um, <laughs> hear, hearing from God is really helpful for, but it's a difference <laughs> between elders, you know, I mean, we should all hear from God when David or even Saul, when they first became kings, they were anointed with the spirit of prophecy. So we, we all should hear from God. And like uh, Randy was saying, you all can prophesy. First Corinthians 14, you may all prophesy one by one, but not all of us do that as regularly as others. So yes. I don't think um, the gift of prophecy or even having that regularly, Romans 12 talks about doing each thing according to the measure of faith the Lord has given you. So some, even some people who do something regularly, may, there may be different levels of it, just like there were in the Old Testament. Yes. But that doesn't, um, just because a person is a prophet doesn't automatically mean that they should be running a local church or, or running something else. Yes, I agree. Um, I, I think one important point to make is, again, back to, I believe, the New Testament view of what a Christian is and what a Christian denies if he falls away, which is this prophetic gifting, whether they're called a prophet or not, the normative experience of the Christian in the New Testament, I believe, is that they hear from God. Okay? Um, but beyond that, uh, and I, I think this is kind of important, I guess we're at the end of the thing here, we should talk a lot more, but I'm just writing a book on uh, that the central emphasized part of the gospel from Jesus in the New Testament has mostly been ignored and even denied by traditional theology. Most of the public record of Jesus' ministry, in the highest percentage, is about healing and driving out demons. And, and here's the most neglected part, I think, of biblical studies and teaching in the church. If we want to be disciples of Jesus, shouldn't we systematically examine what it is Jesus taught his disciples? I mean, is this a tough question or what? You know, shouldn't we at least look at what he taught his disciples explicitly? When he sends them out to do whatever disciples do, what does he tell them to do? And there's at least seven themes in these things. When Jesus, at the earliest strata of the New Testament, the Gospel of Mark, maybe written AD 50, I don't know, Craig's the expert on this, but very early, you have Jesus choosing 12 apostles representing the new Israel, the new people of God, the Spirit upon them. What does he tell them to do? He says he chose them, to be with him in intimacy and communication. And he sent them out, apostle, to proclaim, or kerux, whatever that means. It means to announce or present or whatever. I have the feeling it's really talking about a prophetic process because it doesn't say what they're to preach. Okay? The next thing is, is that he gave them authority to cast out demons. And that's it. Mm. And you look at that and you go, what? 
that's what being a disciple is all about? Well, that's the core. That's the core. And when he sends them out in the commissioning accounts, he expands on that a little bit. And there's seven characteristics that Jesus got from God's instruction to Adam. What did he tell Adam and what his role was and what he was to do? And you'll know this immediately. Identity and intimacy was the first thing. Second was communication. Third was provision. Fourth, declaration. Naming the animals was not, you know, Gertrude and Kanisha and whatever. It was, it was, you know, identifying and empowering them with this word that comes out. God did the same thing in the creation account. The other thing was he gave them authority, dominion over all the earth to keep it, to guard it, and to work it. The word shamar there means to guard, not just keep, like a zookeeper. It's, a, it, it's to guard. Against what? Well, the next thing. To guard against uh, evil and temptation and the devil. And f- the final one, number seven, is multiplication. All of those seven themes come out in Jesus' teaching to his disciples as the core themes that Adam, uh, Adam received from God. And all of our creeds, our theology over the years has drifted into putting out little brush fires about false teaching here and there and here and there. Very random. Half of the Nicene Creed is devoted to explaining the Trinity. But is this what Jesus focused on and emphasized? And I submit it is not. What you're getting in theology is a kind of extraneous Uh, geography of Christianity rather than its central message and mandates. And to get those mandates, you ask yourself, if I'm going to become a disciple, what is it I need to learn from Jesus? And it's right there, but it's the most neglected sections of the New Testament. If if I could just... Just very quickly. Go ahead, Craig, because your eyes speak. You, you know. <laughs> go, go ahead. With with the Mark six, with the preaching, I think probably we should take uh, we should assume that the preaching subject is the same as what Jesus was preaching in chapter one, verses fourteen and fifteen. So, the good news of God, the good news of God's kingdom, um, our God reigns. Which, of course, after the resurrection, we get more specific about it, that the message of the kingdom is the message of the king, namely Jesus. And so, uh, you know, the salvation history uh, climaxes with the, with the death and resurrection. Uh, So, so afterwards, also the hearing from God, just because I think people may, may misunderstand what we mean by this. I do believe, well, I I experienced the gift of prophecy and and God speaks to me and, and leads me, but even when people are hearing from God in Scripture, so a cessationist who may not, uh, you know, they may have been taught that God doesn't work in other ways, but they're, they're, they're still, you know, devotionally listening to what God has to yes, say. Yes, yes. Or the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we're God's children. Yes. Uh, yes. We, we're hearing from God. Or Christ is revealed to them. Right. Yeah. 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 Oh, they're getting it. It's just, fortunately, they're not practicing what they're preaching. You know, I want to pick up on the word you're talking about revealing, the word revelation, and gets us in trouble. I get in trouble because I use the word revelation a lot, but some people say, well, just use the word inspiration and you'll be out of trouble because it's like revelation is connected to, you know, getting scripture. Scripture. But in in most theology, you got general revelation where God makes himself known in nature, you know, and, and in our conscience. Uh, and then you have special revelation, which is the word, the canon. But when I talk about revelation in this way, it's uh, in a prophetic way, it's specific revelation that's not to be part of canon. It's, you know, it's where you get a spe- specific information about someone that helps build their faith, that helps them to know that God has just let 
let them know that he wants to heal them for something or encourage them. Or you need, like when I, I, I needed to know from God clearly that I was to give up my church and move my family halfway across the United States. And, and, and I needed to hear from God he's going to back me up when I went to Toronto. And, and, and these pro personal revelation from people who didn't know I was even thinking about, who called me and spoke to me, or even speaking to me directly in a sense of an impression, but it was a sense of the day I, first day in college, in the Baptist college, uh, I heard the Lord say, the issue of your life, and I didn't hear an audible voice, but it, sh it shook me so much. He's, the first thing I ever heard in college, first day, the issue of your life will be the Holy Spirit. Wow. And, and, and it's turned out to be a, a true word of the Lord. So it's, it's, we need to make room for this third category of revelation that's not canon, and it's not general revelation. It's specific revelation yes. that has to be available. You know, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And so I do agree with, with, with what you're saying. But, John, you used the word a while ago about uh, God speaking to Adam, the word dominion, which takes us to the last part in our eight <laughs> minutes that's left. I stepped on a landmine. <laughs> uh, strategic level spiritual warfare. Um, it, the, the, the issue is this, consider, it's considered a major difference between uh, New Apostolic Reformation leaders and other Christians, and they would even say even other Pentecostals. Uh, critics hold that st uh, strategies released from apostles and prophets relate to dominionism or kingdom now views, which is different, by the way, than Wimber's and Ladd's kingdom now, not yet. It's more of the rush, duty, right. the press, reform, the theonomy, God's going to take over and th through the church, and we're going to make it His reign and rule, even Plus, through legislation by force and power and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. The kingdom now, which requires rejecting dispensational premillennialism and confronting geographical ruling spirits and powers. Um, uh, NAR leaders utilize Daniel 10, 13, and 20 to advocate territorial spirits must be addressed for the kingdom of God to move more effectively to a region. Then the nations will respond in mass to the gospel, and this is what will bring about the greatest harvest of souls the world has seen. Now, this time, I can't say I've never met anybody that believes that, because I have, uh, but they don't believe it exactly that way. Uh, they did believe that there were principalities and that God in His sovereignty could give you authority in that moment to find out what it is you're going to be dealing with and they could temporarily be bound for a few days so that the blinders come off and the masses can hear the, the gospel. And this was Omar Cabrera. However, he would say that the success of his, you know, starting 60,000 60, as people in his movement and 600 churches, I think it was. Uh, but he never taught anybody how to do it. I challenged him. I never taught his biological sons nor his spiritual sons. I don't even know if he thought it was something that could be taught as much as it was something God brought him into. And, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and so, but the, the question is, do you believe that there's a biblical basis for addressing powers and principalities based upon those uh, scriptures? In Daniel 10, Daniel was praying to God. <laughs> yes, yes. And God makes the change. And, and I don't see that changed in the New Testament. I mean, we're not... Um, we're, we're we're ground level. I mean, it's one thing casting out demons from somebody who's demonized on the ground, but in terms of the air forces, you know, we're we're praying yes. to God. I, I don't see a biblical basis for us addressing. Certainly not. Uh, you know, Jude talks about people who are cursing the devil, and so on. Uh, and and we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls and other sources that there were people who were doing that. But um, that's that's not our role. Okay. Thank. You. Thank you, Craig. John, you agree? Well, I think I think we're in for an almost infinite array of spiritual experiences. Mm -hmm. And whereas there were 613 laws in the Old Testament that we had to obey, there's basically one law in the New Testament, and that is find out what God is saying. All of the laws have been replaced uh, certainly confirmed uh, in the New Testament, but the way we know the law now, the way we know God's will is to wait on him and hear his voice. 
my sheep hear my voice. When Jesus went after the scribes, what did he criticize them about? He said, you have not heard his voice. You have not seen his form. His word is not in your heart. Otherwise, you'd know who you're looking at here. You search, darash, midrash, the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But the scriptures themselves speak of me, you see. And so my point about principalities and powers is, is that the new law, Jesus was talking about the new covenant here, and, and how the scribes did not qualify for that because they didn't hear God's voice, they didn't see visions, they didn't see the uh, what God was trying to reveal to them. Not even in Scripture did they see it. And so um, that's the great distinction between religion and the presence of God. And as far as wrestling with principalities and powers and all of that, and, Again, it's what God leads you to do. There's been times when I felt I was wrestling with some really bad demonic stuff. Uh, I can't, can't talk about it here. Part of it is classified, but uh, it literally changed a major part of history. Yeah. Genesis. And it wasn't because I was all that spiritual, I was a basket case emotionally. I was a total mess, and God somehow used me to pray through this horrendous, huge, demonic thing that was coming at me. And I wanted to run, but I couldn't. I was lying on the floor. I could just see this thing coming at me. I was terrified. I've never been so scared in my life. And prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed frantically, confessing sins and everything. Suddenly, I found myself praying for the country. And that somebody had pushed a nuclear button. And we were going to be in for World War III. And it sounds fantastic and all that. I found out 38 years later, that exact thing happened right at that time. Wow. That's you amazing. Know? That's amazing. I, I just want to say, John, for me and, and to Craig, when I came back, because Wimber was very much against uh, strategic level spiritual warfare, he was for ground level, casting out demons and stuff. And uh, w based on the people I met, I interviewed a lot of people in Argentina and in uh, several countries in Latin America. I come away thinking that I see some biblical basis for some of the things they did, the identificational repentance, and like you see in the Old Testament. But I didn't feel like God had given me the authority or the call to do it. And secondly, it, uh, there is can be dangerous, uh, particularly you know if you don't have the authority, of the call, and especially if you're trying to come against the devil and you got some you know unconfessed sin in your life or something. It can you know you gotta <laughs> gotta put a target on you, um, as my friend John Paul Jackson wrote, "Needless Casualties of War." I, I I really believe that even some of the first introduction to that book with the women and having a miscarriage. I actually think that was a uh, part of the uh, happening at the vineyard uh, where John Wimber addressed it. And I just felt like I believe it's possible. I believe it's there's reality here, but I believe it's. And I talked to Cindy Jacobs about it. It's, it's something that she did not do very frequently, and it was only since a sense of authority and of a lot of backing of a, the, uh, the pastors of the city. Uh, but I don't do it personally, and I know people who do, and I think it's uh, wisdom. I agree. You need to be called into it, and um, I definitely haven't felt like God's called me t to get involved in that. Yeah. Um, Charity, That's the we bottom got line. Four. Yeah. We got 46 seconds left. Oh. Anything you want to ask? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give us your full testimony. Oh, <laughs> Nothing bad. Re Re Revelation in, in um, 1 Corinthians 14 and, and elsewhere in the New Testament, the translation of it actually is used for prophecy and things like that. So biblically, in terms of English usage, it, it's not limited to Scripture. Thank you. Scripture. Thank you. I'm glad that... <laughs> gave me a little more authority there. Anyway. I, no final thoughts? 
No final thoughts. All right. <laughs> well, I want to thank you both for being on. This is the first one that we're doing that deals with this subject, and we are going to have different people of all different walks of life, including some really uh, uh, interesting key leaders who oversee apostolic networks and getting their opinion and what their practices are and, and all. And I thank you for bringing us at least here's as two biblical scholars uh, your insights, and thank you for giving us the time. And, uh, and know both of you, love both of you, honor both of you. Thank you so much. Yes, Craig is my glory and my joy. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, I'm, I'm really cool. grateful to, to all of you. All right. Well, let's pray. Father, we pray that what we talked about will somehow help somebody. In Jesus' name, use it for your glory. And it's all about Jesus, and it's all yes. about what he's made possible for us. And we thank you that he has not left us here as orphans, but we can hear the voice of our Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bless you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Craig. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you like the content that you receive from this channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Also, give us a thumbs up and share our content with all of your friends and family. It really helps us out. We also invite you to consider partnering with us. We're a nonprofit ministry with a mission to awaken the world to the power of the gospel. If you'd like to help us continue creating content, consider giving at the link on the screen or text the word donation to 21,000. If you want even more of our spirit-filled content, consider a subscription to globalondemand.tv, our subscription video platform. Thanks.